Tonight on Criminal Confessions. This man is a serial killer the police knew nothing about. I said, it's not if I'm going to kill, it's when. The only question is when. The question is when. Bernard Getz in 1984. If I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. The only, my problem was I ran out of bullets. Bernard Getz today. I think a lot of people would prefer to have me as mayor. What makes a 16-year-old boy kill? Yo, this ends now. Ranch at the school. Grabs Christina. Bam, right in the heart. The twisted logic of Luke Woodham. And finally, we will take you inside the mind of Richard Allen Davis, the man who killed Polly Class, my daughter. How could there be a god if Richard Allen Davis could get his hands on Polly? And this is Criminal Confessions, a program where the criminal's own words will give you a small window into the minds capable of these horrific acts. Violent criminals hurt or kill over 8 million people a year. My daughter Polly was one of them. If we can understand this evil better, maybe we as a society can do something about it. Out of all of the criminals we looked at, none has committed more murders or confessed more often than Joseph Paul Franklin. For three years, he traveled the country, killing and wounding dozens of people. Police had no idea that it was all the work of just one man. Joseph Paul Franklin was a killer with a mission. One of the first crimes he confessed to was a sniping attack on a group of people coming out of a synagogue in St. Louis in October of 1977. Well, I knew that uh... St. Louis had a large Jewish community, so I decided to go up there just to look for a synagogue and kill some Jews there. Do you have any remorse for what you did? Uh, I can't say that I have. The only thing I'm sorry about, I'm not sorry I did it, I'm just sorry that, you know, uh, it's not legal, you know. What's not legal? Killing Jews. Franklin also confessed to the 1977 bombing of a Chattanooga synagogue, to gunning down two black children in Cincinnati, to shooting and killing a black man sitting by a window in a fast food restaurant in Falls Church, Virginia, to shooting interracial couples in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Madison, Wisconsin, and Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He also shot Larry Flint and Vernon Jordan. Over 20 people died in a three-year crime spree from 1977 to 1980. Yet no one even knew the crimes were connected at first. No one knew until a license plate tied Joseph Paul Franklin to the killing of two black men who were jogging with white women in Utah. Franklin was convicted and sentenced to two life terms in the federal penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. And it was there he started to confess everything he had done. Joseph Riansky is one of the many prosecutors and law enforcement officers nationwide who's come to know Joseph Paul Franklin. Uh, his welcome to Marion in 1980 uh, was when a group of black prisoners set on him and stabbed him, I think, 21 times and nearly killed him. And somewhere along the line, he developed the delusion that the federal government had a plot to assassinate him and he needed to get out of Marion. So he began a series of confessions to crimes all across the United States, Missouri, Chattanooga, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, other places I've, I've lost count. Law enforcement officials didn't believe him at first, but every one of these confessions has proved true. Uh, why? Well, confession is good for the soul, you know? So I just want everybody, I just want to set the record straight on what every, everything I did, you know? I haven't forgotten anything I've done, you know? I mean, how can you forget when you kill somebody? Homicide detective Mike O'Brien has become something of a Franklin expert. 
his ability to recall specific details about offenses that have occurred sometimes years ago. Certain details about these offenses where I think the normal person would, would not remember. With him, there's clarity and sometimes almost total recall. These are sort of trophies to him. Franklin now sits, waiting to die, in Potosi State Penitentiary in Missouri for his sniper attack on the synagogue. Franklin agreed to talk to us on the condition that a woman do the interview. So executive producer Marley Klaus talked to him while I watched and waited from a few feet away. You started killing Jews first, Correct. though, right? Correct. Why were you killing Jews? Uh, well, I was just, I figured, I uh, saw them as the cause of all the troubles in the world, which is not true. I see that now, you know, and wanted to kill as many as I could. That's why I blew up the synagogue, you know, and committed the sniper attack. And let's say one or at least one other bombing of a synagogue. Franklin's lethal hatred soon shifted from Jews to blacks. Here, Franklin is confessing to killing Raymond Taylor, who was simply eating in a Burger King in Falls Church, Virginia. I decided he would be a good target because of where he was sitting at, and there wasn't anyone else around. He had him right in the crosshairs, and then just slowly squeeze the trigger. And then right, you know, I, I, I dropped him right on the first shot. Like most of Franklin's murders, he was shooting from a great distance away. A bizarre choice of criminal behavior for a man who has terrible vision. Your eyesight is not that good, so can you yeah, explain? Yeah, I'm about as close to blind as one can get. You know, I just make uh, use of what I've got, you know. I mean, I can see well enough to shoot, you know. Even though you're 100 yards away or 50 yards, you know, taking a gun and aiming at somebody, knowing you're fixing to take a human life, and you could get caught and spend the rest of your life in prison or get executed for it, it's scary. It's not easy, I assure you. If you're so scared of it, why do it? It was just something that, uh, it was the will of God that I, I do it, you know, so. And this sounds kind of strange, but I actually thought God wanted me to do that stuff. Which cases do you think that you were doing God's work? Uh, well, the mixed race couples, you know. So, you know, carried that, you know, that when that's, carried to its ultimate conclusion, what's that going to be, the, the complete mixing of the races here, you know? His war against so-called race mixers led Franklin to a killing even he has trouble talking about. Why won't you talk to me about Mercedes? Uh, I just not really, because of the nature of that crime, mm -hmm. I'd rather not get into it. The only thing I would say to you is I did it. Can you tell me why that one you don't want to talk about? Maybe it had something to do with the fact that I had sex with her first. And when she told me she'd had sex with a black dude, then, you know, that completely changed things. I decided to kill her. But you could have just left. Yeah, I know it, but I decided already, this was in 79, if I found any women who had dated blacks, to kill them. You know, if I had any woman in the car who told me she dated blacks, she was history. That would be it, you know. I shot her in the head with a 12-gauge shotgun. So you can imagine that, what damage that'll do, you know, so. It's just really gruesome, you know. The murder of Mercedes Masters was a profound deviation for Franklin. Normally, he was as far away from his victims as possible when he killed them. Very few people really have, are able to sit up, you know, or sit there and visualize things, you know like I am, you know, I'm, I'm really good at vis visualization and all, you know, so I can actually just look at a scene and figure out a really good place to ambush somebody. I believe his choice of the way he committed the murders, the sniper type shootings, says to me that he's somewhat cowardly, that he, although he professes to have a deep hatred for the people that he's killing, he has a sort of a fear of interacting with these people that, that are the victims. I mean, I guess I was, you know, kind of programs from birth to do the stuff that I'm doing today. What do you mean by that? Well, everything, everything that we do today, that we're doing in this life today, I feel that we agreed to do it before we were even born. The father was an alcoholic, uh, abusive, was kind of in and out of the picture as far as the family's concerned. The mother, uh, staunch German, very much of a perfectionist, uh, kind of a taskmaster. Uh, Joseph was the oldest son and he usually took the brunt 
of the abuse from the father and the mother. Dr. Chris Mohandi is a psychologist who's an expert on the workings of the criminal mind. What he's done is he's created a world view where these people out there, these um, people of other groups, Jewish people, African American people, he's got this rage that really should have been targeted at his family and probably is targeted at his family that he's put on to these groups and made them into his oppressors. There's a psychologist that looked at some of these tapes and he said that your dislike of all of these groups is probably misplaced rage towards your family, that who you really wanted to kill was my mother. They're exactly right. Because I had a dream just a few years ago while I was at Marion, and it said, you're in prison right now because you killed your mother. That is the reason you're locked up. You killed your mother. How could society recognize your potential to kill people? Oh, I see. And I always used to talk about it. I'm sorry? I always used to talk about it. You used to talk yeah. about it. And I remember telling a girl I knew up there, you know, in Silver Spring, Maryland. I said, you know, it's not if I'm going to kill some niggers, it's when. The only question is when. I mean, I remember telling her that, and I used to talk about it all the time. To her and to anybody who would listen? Anybody who would listen. But they didn't take me seriously. People got to remember they should take everything people say seriously, especially if it's a threat to kill. As a way of furthering his mission of igniting a race war, Franklin went after civil rights leaders. His first target was Jesse Jackson. I initially was, you know, targeting him and stalking him. You know, went up to Chicago a couple of times, but I never got a shot at him. I guess it just wasn't in the cards that I shoot uh, Reverend uh, Jackson. But. Is that a disappointment? Huh? Are you disappointed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But Franklin didn't let that disappointment stop him. What are the acts he considers his life's greatest achievements? I guess the, the two uh, shootings I did of high publicity of celebrities, Vernon Jordan and Larry Flint, uh, it was just something to me that it meant to me that I was able to uh, beat the system, you know, do it, you know, shoot them and get away with it. Larry Flint talks for the first time on camera about the man who paralyzed him. And I confront Franklin when we come back. Welcome back. We continue with our story about a man who confessed to killing 21 people and shooting Vernon Jordan and Larry Flint, Joseph Paul Franklin. In 1978, Larry Flint, publisher of the Pornographic Hustler magazine, was on trial in Georgia, charged with obscenity. Unknown to him, there was a would-be assassin stalking him, Joseph Paul Franklin. He told executive producer Marley Klaus it started when he picked up an issue of Hustler magazine and saw something he didn't like. Just showed a black male and a white female together. And when I closed it up, I, thought, I just thought to myself, I'm going to kill that guy. And how did you feel if someone like Larry Flint didn't die? I was upset about it. I was wishing later that I had actually fired, you know, you know, emptied the gun and, you know, actually fired it, you know, all six or seven rounds at him, you know. But I thought at the time that he was already dead. I, you know, it was only one of the first snipings I'd ever committed, so I wasn't that good at it then. But if I'd have done that two or three years later, I would have just, you know, he would have been history, you know. At one point, you were quoted as saying that you were sorry you shot him, are you? Yeah, uh, oh, I do regret that, yeah. He's not the kind of person I would go out shooting, you know, today. Just the type of person he is, you know. Rebel, you know, which is basically what I am, you know. Until I sat down with Larry Flint, he had never before talked on camera Please. about the man who shot him. Right across the I never really looked at it as who shot me but rather what shot me in terms of the mentality of someone that would kill someone else simply because they disagreed with their views. He said that shooting you was the only act that he regrets. Uh, I'm in a wheelchair today as a result of it, so it's not much consolation to me that he feels bad about it, but I, 
don't have vengeance in this situation. So if I were to put you in a room with Franklin and you out of 357, what would happen? Nothing. You're a better man than I am, Larry Flint. You're a better man than I am. Maybe you have more of a reason. Finally, after waiting and watching, I got a chance to confront this cold-blooded killer. Okay, Mark, I'll tell you what. Uh, I remember from the first uh, news accounts of your daughter's kidnapping and murder, I really feel for you, you know? Yeah, I would like to cut that guy's head off who killed her. If I had him in here right now, I would literally, with a knife, cut his head off, man. What makes him different from you? Huh? Well, I mean, I would hope you don't really put me in his category. I mean, I just cannot see killing an innocent little girl, you know? And so, it just really pissed me off, you know? Have you killed the mothers of kids? Uh, not that I know of. The fathers of children? Uh, I'm not sure about that either. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, wait a minute, yeah. Do you have any idea what the killing of my child has done to my family, the ripple effect? Uh, let's see. Look at me. Well, I, I really, I mean, uh, I really wouldn't know what to say, quite honestly. Do you feel anything for these people? Who? The families of the people that you killed? Uh, yes, I do, very much. Then why did you kill their relatives? I did not know. Well, I mean, I was misguided at the time, right? You know, I did not know who, you know, it never occurred to me, you know, that they would have families, you know? And so, you know, I never really felt any sympathy for their families or them, really. And, you know, I was just on a mission to try to, you know, start a race war, get a lot of blacks killed. You know, we would eventually won the war, you know, and wiped them out. That was my goal. The man who destroyed dozens of lives trying to ignite a race war now spends 23 hours a day alone thinking about what he might be doing if he hadn't been caught. Well, I might have just started going after government leaders. You know, that would have been, oh, I would have got a lot more publicity that way. And it would have made them look weak because, you know, here's a guy who can actually commit assassinations and get away with them. Joseph Paul Franklin believes that despite being on death row, he may one day be able to continue on his mission. I've just got various dreams and omens that way. Well, you know, I could be out there on the street. I mean, miracles do happen, you know. Uh, with God, all things are possible, the Bible says. You know, I've got a death sentence now, and, um, you know, I've been convicted of uh, and sentenced to 12 different life terms plus the death sentence. I mean, the odds of me ever getting out are very are slim to none, if, you know, if you go just by man's standards, you know, but not by God's standards. See, he can actually get me out if he wants to. Our next confessor says he's running for mayor of New York City. When we return, Bernard gets. When Bernard Getz opened fire on the four teenagers who asked him for money in 1984, he touched a nerve nationwide. A criminal to some, a martyr to others. His case was a turning point for crime in America. Now, 14 years later, Bernard Getz says he wants to run New York City. Why are you running for mayor of New York City? I think I'm a uh, reasonable alternative. I think a lot of people uh, uh, would prefer to have me as mayor. But mayoral candidate Get says he is not going to run on the issue of crime. Crime really doesn't represent life. It's a real, it's actually, it's a very small fraction of life, but it is a problem that has to be addressed. The way how to do it is to get uh, perps off the street. What do you think about that rehabilitation? I, I, I don't think much of it. Uh, with human beings, uh, past conduct is often a good indicator of future conduct. Fourteen years ago, when a teenager asked him for money one afternoon on a New York City subway, Bernard Getz shot him and his three friends. The incident erupted in the nation's news. 
When Getz was done, Daryl Cabey, Troy Canty, James Ramzur, and Barry Allen each had one bullet in them. All survived. But Daryl Cabey remains paralyzed and brain damaged. Getz got away, but voluntarily turned himself in nine days later. Here is his confession. I wanted to kill those guys. I wanted to maim those guys. I wanted to make them suffer in every way I could. And you can't understand that because it's a, it's a realm of reality you're not familiar with. Try and make me okay. explain to me why you wanted to do these things to me. Why? Explain to me. I, I how, can, how can someone explain to you? You ask. You ask a person who has been a victim of violence. You ask them to explain I, I, look, if I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. The old, my problem was I ran out of bullets. Barry Slotnick was Getz's criminal defense attorney. The first time I saw that tape, I was moved. And I said, you know what? This jury will now understand what this case is about. On that videotape, Bernie Getz makes his confession, but tells his story. And it was so important. Mike Clark was a New York City homicide detective who took Getz's confession soon after he turned himself in. This was a very uh, upset, scared, uh, frightened man. Someone that did not want to be there. Someone that just thought his world was coming to an end, maybe. I just want you to think about the truth for a couple days. You know, and the truth is ugly, it's disgusting, and I was a monster, I don't deny it, but I wasn't a monster until several years ago in New York. Now you have to keep in mind that two years previous to this, Bernard was savagely mugged and received serious injuries. And at that point in time, he said, I will never let this happen to me again. He blasted a hole in Daryl Cavey's body. Ron Kuby represented the teen paralyzed in the shooting in the 1996 civil case against Getz. This is the moment that Bernard Getz has been waiting for for years and years, walking around with that illegal gun in his pocket and his heart full of hatred. This was going to be showdown time for Bernard Getz. He wasn't afraid in the least. Mark Leslie was a juror in the criminal trial. These are all pretty street-hardened kids who had all been in plenty of fights, whereas Getz was your typical physical coward. Surrounded by three or four of these guys, there's no doubt he was being faced with the implied threat of deadly force, which is all New York state law requires of you to take a preemptive strike, which Getz did. When I saw his smile and the look in his eye, it was at that point I decided I was going to kill them all, murder them all, do anything. I was gonna, I was gonna gouge one of the guy's eyes out with my keys afterwards. And I came up to him. I saw his eyes twitching. I saw the fear. The reason, the only reason I didn't do it is because he had changed his look. And what Get says happened next was the most widely reported moment of the shooting. It's all very cold-blooded, and this, and this is gonna offend everyone. I went back to the other two to check on them, and the fellow who was standing up, I said, "You seem to be doing all right. Here's another." During the course of the trial. We prove this confession to be totally untrue. Those that have made a study of dealing with people who fire weapons, FBI agents, police officers, Bernie Getzes, they say that up until that point of pulling the trigger, the mind pretty well recollects things. Once you pull that trigger, the rest is not to be counted upon as being correct. Based on this, Getz was acquitted of attempted murder, but convicted of a much lesser charge, illegal gun possession. However, the teen Getz paralyzed sued and won a $43 million judgment against him. They didn't die? Well, that's God, what God has wanted, evidently, if there is a God. But I, in my heart, was a murderer. It was sadistic and savage. It was, that's, that was my, that was me. And, and, did I, did I? That was me. Today, Bernard Getz would rather not discuss what happened on the subway. Instead, he's talking about what he'll do as mayor of New York. I would maintain the present status quo, what I call the Giuliani status quo, 
but I'd have a more tolerant drug policy. The way how you make a kinder and gentler world is to take care of problems in the world, to advance uh, civilization. Did you advance civilization, Bernie? That's what the, one of the board of uh, uh, directors of the National Rifle, Rifle Association told me. He said, you advance civilization when you shot those guys. People are going to want to know if you still carry a gun. I usually never carry a gun. A number of uh, anti-gun people, when they've confronted me, I've uh, asked them, I said, what, what else uh, other than a gun would have helped me against uh, those guys? And none of them have had an answer. What if they said uh, pepper spray? That's interesting. Against four? Would you, would you be willing to take on four guys with a can of pepper spray? I, I, don't, I don't think I would. not Also, if someone came into your house, do you think you'd want a can of pepper spray? You know, give me a 38. And Getz says he has no regrets about the shooting. The two who were in critical condition, one of them who was KB, who was paralyzed, and the other one was Ramzor, who wound up doing a violent rape afterwards. It probably would have been better if society didn't intervene and didn't give them medical attention and let them die. Even today? Oh, abso abso absolutely. No guilt? About, about the incident? None. We'll be back in a moment. On October 1st, 1997, 16-year-old Luke Woodham walked into Pearl High School in Mississippi and killed two students and shot and wounded seven more. The question is, why? Luke was characterized by both his peers and by himself as a child that was picked on from kindergarten all the way through uh, high school. How built up inside of me over, over time. I knew I was going to snap. I just wanted to kill her. I wanted to do this. I wanted revenge on Christine. The confession of high school killer Luke Woodham, less than one hour after killing two classmates and wounding seven others. But I just went there and uh, got the gun, turned around, ran towards the school. I yelled, this ends now. I ran inside the school, ran up to Christina. Bam, right in the heart. She just ran him with the gun. Ran with the gun. Luke Woodham began by killing his former girlfriend, Christina Menifee. Then he turned his gun on other children. I shot like you do. I don't know why. Just, I shot. Turned around and I, I just shot off into the crowd. Alan Westbrook, he's lying down the ground. He had always picked on me. He always made fun of me. I just got really mad. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. Um, I don't know if I killed him or not. I don't think so. I know I shot him once there, and I shot him again. Then I put another bullet in there. I mean, it sounded like you, you were pretty much together. I mean, like this boy. Uh, I'm not. I'm not insane. I knew what I was doing. I was just really pissed at the time. You were just mad. I'm mad at the world. Dr. Mick Jepson. The forensic psychologist hired by Luke Woodham's defense attorneys says I Luke's calm demeanor is remarkable. This is, ex is very extreme, and the indication of the extremity of that is that he's done um, uh, an incredibly horrendous act, and in less than 45 minutes has no apparent emotional response that would fit the situation. Dr. Chris Mahandi viewed Luke's confession. But my speculation about Luke Woodham, he finally finds somebody that's going to love him and fix him, make him feel better, make him feel whole. She dumps him. He perceives that she's abandoned him and has humiliated him in that process. And his way to deal with the shame that he feels, that is even more pronounced now that he's loved and lost, is to settle the score and make things right, to, to destroy the source of his shame. Why'd you do it, Luke? Why? Uh, I loved her more than any other thing on this earth. A friend of ours set us up, and you know, it, for a while it was, just, it was perfect. I mean, nothing went wrong, nothing. I actually had somebody to love and somebody loved me. For the first time in my life. We broke up about a year ago. Uh -huh. And uh, she hurt his feelings. She's the first person I shot. Got her right in the heart. And that's significant. He didn't shoot her in the heart. It was important for him to be able to say that he shot her through the love, through the heart. That the only way 
To make the pain stop is to kill the love. Christina may have been the first person Luke shot at the school, but she wasn't Luke's first murder that day. Detective Aaron Hirschfield was on his way in to get Luke's confession when an officer pulled him aside. He said, uh, Luke just told me that uh, he'd killed his mother. He said, I, all I did was ask him about a cut on his hand. And I asked him, how'd you get it? And he said, you know, stabbing my mother. We had no idea that, you know, he'd even killed his mother at the time. So I immediately got on the radio and uh, sent some patrol units to go to his home residence. What happened at the house? Oh, I was in bed. I got a pillow, went to the kitchen, got a butcher knife. I uh, walked to my mom's room, put it over her head, and stabbed her to death. She never loved me. She just quit. She <laughs> you know, me. <laughs> always. She always told me I wouldn't amount to anything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and. It's just my ninth grade year up here, she always just was against me. Just always against me. What Luke didn't speak about on this tape, but came out later in court was that an older boy named Grant Boyette supposedly encouraged Luke to kill his mother and to gun down students at school. Boyette has been charged with that crime, but he's denied it and pled not guilty. Timothy Jones was a prosecutor on the Luke Woodham case. He testified at trial that, that Grant Boyette kind of introduced him to satanic practice and, and that he should be in control and the people who he thought had done him wrong should die. He called Grant to tell him that he had killed his mother, had essentially carried out that part of the plan, and he stated that Grant had cheered him on and told him to go on to the school and finish the job. Grant Boyette came along at a time when Luke was particularly vulnerable. Based on his conversations with Luke, Dr. Jepson says that months before these killings, Boyette first tested his control over Luke by ordering him to kill his beloved pet dog, Sparkle. Woodham wrote in his journal in detail about doing it. I guess it was there going to be a first taste of, of um, brutally killing something. They put the dog in a plastic bag, lit the bag on fire, and then the dog was screaming. Luke wrote down exactly, step by step, and in vivid detail, everything they did to Sparkle. I, I expected to die today. And I had a will written there. I had a eulogy for my funeral. In the eulogy Luke Woodham wrote, murder is not weak and slow-witted. Murder is gutsy and daring. I kill because people like me are mistreated every day. I am malicious because I am miserable. I probably said everything. Just remember me. And well, I guess the world's gonna remember me now. I'm probably gonna get pretty famous. Which is real. He got pretty famous. But that issue was not to get famous. The issue was that he was understood. That's the significant aspect of that, is that the world understands him now. And the world does. Three people are dead, and Pearl, Mississippi will never be the same. Now, Luke Woodham, who hated being picked on by his fellow classmates at school, will spend the rest of his life living with violent criminals in prison. And now, the tragedy of my daughter, Polly. It was October 1st, 1993, when a bearded stranger broke into my ex-wife's home. While her mother slept in the next room, he terrorized Polly and two friends who were over there for a sleepover party. They were threatened and tied up. And Polly was dragged away into the night. No one knew why. Then, two months later, a sweatshirt, a piece of cloth, and a piece of Polly's tights found on a hillside near Petaluma led police to this man, Richard Allen Davis. The suspect was a career criminal with a lengthy rap sheet. No murders, but several crimes of violence against women. When he was brought in for questioning, he denied everything. Sir, sir, have a seat. Larry Taylor. This is Rick Davis. Larry Pelton. What's this concerning that you're asking me about? Talking about That's what we want to talk to you about, is the polyclass kidnapping. Yeah. Hey, me. 
any of my type of criminal behavior. I mean, you gotta make sure you weren't involved. I know okay. in here I wasn't involved. Okay. All right. Sick f That's a sick f***ing crime. Rape, whatever you want to call it. And it's a coward's crime. And the interrogators now know they've got him. You know nothing about it. Hell no. You kidnapped that little f***ing broad. Now get real. You talk. You talked about rape and things like that. We didn't uh, mention anything about that. We mentioned kidnapping the public class. Nobody said anything about I told uh, you sexual assault of the little girl. I just told you I didn't snatch the little bro. We very comfortable you did. Well, the only thing I care about is why. And I just want you to tell me that. I can't, I can't. Why? Because I don't have done nothing to be answering the why. We're just trying to go. talk to you. Well, hey, no, you're going to jail in a different area. You're man. telling me this and that. Book me. Let's get shit or get off the pot. Let's go for it. Polly was still missing, and Davis wasn't talking. But within days, the case took a dramatic turn. When we come back. And now, the end of Polly's story and the lessons we can learn from it. Just days after this interview in which Richard Allen Davis denied everything, police confirmed that the palm print found in my daughter's bedroom was his. Cornered, Davis decided to talk, but not to the FBI agents who first interrogated him. Instead, he called the local cop who brought him in, Mike Meese. Understanding that right, do you wish to talk to us now? Yes. Okay. The hairiest moment of this entire interview with Davis there's always that initial couple of minutes. Even though he had reinitiated contact with me and we had talked and we had talked on the phone, there was still a chance. He could have decided to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to say anything and I'm out of here. Brian Sobel interviewed Richard Allen Davis in prison for a book he's co-authoring about the case. Richard Allen Davis told me that in that interview there was play acting going on that Mies was acting and that he was acting as well. And much of that is happening because he is trying to bond in his own way with the person who's interrogating him about the crime. Feel better getting that off your chest? No. I'm gonna go through the whole thing. No, you ain't got you know, I know I'm a piece of shit. You ain't got you know, show is, me you know. This is hard though, and I understand that, and I appreciate you being man enough to own up to what happened. I reached out and have touched him. I patted his shoulder and patted his knee. People look at that and say, you know, look at the heinous crime this person did. And that's true. But if I had treated him uh, like he said, you know, like a piece of shit, th that would have put me in a position of not being able to relate to him on a one-to-one -one basis. At first, Mies was still hoping, as I was, that Polly was still alive. First thing, let's get first thing. Is she alive? Just can we go get her? She's not, she, she's she's not, not alive. alive. No. Certainly in my mind, there was a, a finality to the fact that, you know, all the hope of, you know, perhaps she's alive, perhaps we're on time. Do you know where she is now? Yeah, basically. Why don't we back up to October 1st? Okay. Why don't you tell me, why don't you tell me what happened that night? And my intent is where to go see my mother. Okay. See, well, see if she'd be willing to help me some. What he's trying to do is mitigate the reasons that he's in Petaluma. In other words, I didn't come to Petaluma to commit this crime. I came to Petaluma to see my mother. A bizarre notion since he'd said in his first interview that he hated her. I ain't got nothing to do with the bitch, man. I'm, my brother, he <laughs> with her, you know, but I got nothing for him. He's letting a little bit of Richard Helen Davis out here through you Dr. See Chris Mahandi. And that's, that becomes significant to understanding his crime. 
He's got rage towards his family. I don't care about them. I'm angry at them. This is his connection to being in the world, and he hates it. And if you hate your connection to being in the world, how can you be expected to develop connections with other people? It's the boulder-sized chip on his shoulder that he's been carrying around his whole life, and he has chosen not to do anything about except inflict it on other people. When Davis failed to find his mother, Davis said he drank beer and smoked marijuana in a park, winding up his night by breaking into Polly's bedroom. Finally, at the end of a very long interrogation, Davis told the chilling truth. He talks about the actual act of killing Polly, and he talks about uh, taking uh, a cloth ligature, placing it on her neck, and then she falls to the ground, and he describes uh, graphically for us how he watches her struggle. Tell me what you did. Strangled her. Sorry? Strangled her. You strangled her? How did you strangle her? She was getting ready to get in the car, just put it over. What'd you put over? Cloth. Where did you put it? Over her neck. Over her neck? Over back over. Over back over. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you hold the cloth? <sighs> wow. I remember easing up, mm -hmm. and I thought I heard her groan or something. Mm -hmm. So what'd you do then? Tied it back up on the claw. You tied it, you just, would you pull yeah, it back up again? Pull it back up, okay. tighten it up. Did you tie a knot in the cloth? Yeah. Okay. That was and why did he pick Polly? After many years of failed assaults and so forth, it may have been that he finally found a victim that he could control from beginning to end. Richard Allen Davis sits, along with hundreds of others like him, waiting to die in San Quentin prison. What is it that makes these people evil? For some of these people, they actually get to a place, Mark, where they make a decision, and the decision is this. This is who I am. This is the kind of person that I will be, and I'm not going to back down in respect to these things. I'm not going to try to control these things anymore. I'm going to live with it and make this a part of who I am. But the question of why someone like Davis exists still haunts me. I talked with Reverend Michael Beckwith of Los Angeles, who's national co-chair of a season for nonviolence, which kicked off its second annual event at the United Nations in January. He's devoted his ministry to finding ways to stop violence in our society. I asked him about Pauly's killer. At some point, he got captured by a thought and it was more enticing and more hypnotizing and more um, intriguing to him than doing the right thing. This, this thought made him feel alive. Exploring the dark side as opposed to exploring the light. Yes, it made him feel more alive to do that. How could there be a God if Richard Allen Davis could get his hands on Paul? Yeah, I understand, and those, those questions are so difficult to answer. Let me ask you something. Why do you do this? for several reasons, certainly to have a better understanding myself of the nature of evil and what can be done to curb evil in our society. Uh, secondly, and it equally as important, is that my daughter gave meaning to her own life, but I believe only I can give meaning to Polly's death, so I pursue many different avenues. My greatest teacher was 12 years old. Yeah. I'm trying to follow the example of a little girl. Just. I, I, she was a super person. And that's why I, I have such problems with this. Oftentimes, people find comfort when, as you have done, they look at the person and see what they lived for, however span a time that was, 10 years, 12 years. Instead of asking the question, what is the meaning of life? We reverse the question. We ask, how can I give my life meaning based on this event, based on this circumstance? But if you can find meaning in your life because of that, then you're not allowing her life to be lived in vain.